Kurt Campbell is the White House coordinator for the Indo-Pacific, and he's joining us on China Talk today to celebrate China Talk's 300th episode. Thank you so much. Well, happy birthday. Congratulations. And it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you very much. And, and welcome to the old executive office building here at the White House. Kurt, how do you conceptualize comprehensive national power today? And how has your vision of that changed over time? Well, look, you know, it's a it's a challenging question, obviously. Um, I think particularly when you're in a period in which um, you're pairing, you're comparing uh, great powers in terms of their ability to um, exert themselves on the international stage. Um, I think in those environments, it's not possible to simply look at any one um, venue of power. And so I would argue that to be effective in today's age, it requires not just military power. And I think too often we, when we discuss power in the United States, um, we're often thinking about military power, but increasingly that definition um, has to do with the health of our society, the health of our democracy, our investment in education, our ability to lead the world in innovation technology, and not just one technology, but several. I think by those metrics, the United States stacks up well, but there clearly are some warning signs and areas where the United States has to be attentive. And I think one of the things that the Biden administration has tried to do is to recognize some of those areas, invest in them, and try to double down on ensuring that the United States continues to play a leading role. So let's set a baseline goal for U.S. policy in 2050. We'll take Mike Green and buy more than Providence. He identifies the traditional aim of opposing any other power exercising exclusive hegemonic control over Asia or the Pacific. Or we can take yours, slightly more ambitious of, uh, you know, sustaining the operating, sy or operating system that the U.S. has set up in Asia over the past 75 years. My, like, little... Uh, uh, rubric for the three things the U.S. needs to execute on is long-term economic growth, maintaining alliance networks, and not imploding domestically. Um, you, and, and you sort of have the, a major war as a potential wild card there. Am I missing, or what, what's missing in that schematic? So, look, I uh, I think that's a good list. I don't think what Mike presents and uh, what I do are inconsistent. I think there's a lot of overlap. I would just add one thing to this, if I can, um, and I recognize that, you know, for people who think about power, sometimes um, they don't like the intrusion of issues that are not uh, traditional. But in fact, um, if we don't figure out how to consequentially deal with climate change, the effects of which are hitting us much earlier in a much more profound way than I think even some of the warriors uh, thought, I, I, I don't think we'll be able to deal with some of these other uh, challenges. So I think what I'd add to that probably are some transnational issues, but at the top of that really would be climate change. And that means sea level rise, that means, um, you know, uncontrolled migration, that means, you know, changes in everything from crops to, you know, uh, sea habitats. These are all at risk now much earlier than anticipated. And that's one of the things that requires the United States working more consequentially with not just allies and partners, but other countries that we have disagreements with. I think in truth, we have been loath. Um, we you know, try not to call out particular countries, but China is going to have to do much more in this uh, arena if we are to address the most significant uh, elements of climate change over the course of the next uh, period ahead. So um, let's do a little uh, Chinese comprehensive national power overview. Have you revised your expectations over the past few years? I'm not sure, I, not necessarily revised, but refined. I, I, think, um, I think what has been brought clear to us over the course of the little, last little while is you know, when you deal with um, the people who, who have long experience with China, either in the business realm or elsewhere, they will often say things like, you know, the Chinese or China is a practical nation, and they will often find their way to practical solutions. I think my um, 
recent experience, at least with the top level of leadership, would suggest that even more than practical or you know specific steps, uh, ideology is at the core of what drives China today. And you cannot understand or engage effectively without an understanding about how important ideology is to Xi Jinping and his lieutenants. Sure. So yeah, let's turn to ideology for a second then. So I was pleasantly surprised to discover your first book was an archival history of Soviet South Africa relations of all things. It's a, it's a, it's a bestseller. It's a, it's amazing. You got a hold of it. Um, uh, it was, it was difficult, but we have our ways here at China talk. Um, uh, you did make this interesting argument that the U S sort of bought into the nationalist, it's a national party line that they were, you know, about to succumb to like a total onslaught. Um, and in fact, the U S maybe like over, um, uh, weighted the ideological sort of bent of, um, you know, how the Soviet Union was approaching Africa, South Africa and Africa more broadly. Yeah. Um, I don't know, compare that to Rush Do Doshi's book, uh, sort of where, where do you think sort of late, uh, Soviet foreign policy and today's, uh, China stack up in terms of, I don't know, ideological commitment to global, um, preeminence. Look, I, I it, there is an af apple and oranges quality to trying to compare both the cold war to this period, um, uh, of competition with China. Um, but you know, it is an interesting arena of thought to try to understand how important ideology is uh, in, you know, various periods in, in particular regimes. My sense is that um, uh, currently at the highest levels of China, again, I think um, an ideological frame is uh, central to understanding them. I think they think in terms of correlations of power, periods of history, um, and often see the United States through that lens, late stage capitalism and the like. Um, I, I think uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, I think there were clear signs inside the Soviet regime of the challenges that the country was facing. Uh, remember, even though we may have got it wrong in the United States, I think internally they understood that they were not meeting their five-year plans, that they were facing challenges about putting too much money into the military industrial part of the economy, and they were not innovating in the way that was necessary. Some of the Soviet theorists on the military side worried about the kinds of investments that the United States was making and that the Soviets were not keeping up a Soviet leader named uh, Ogarkov, who thought about sort of what he re referred to as the revolution in military affairs. Um, I don't think the Chinese believe in any way that they have elements of decline in their system. I think what animates them is not only a sense of aggrievement at the highest level, the idea of reversing decades or a century of what they call humiliation, but also a sense that China's time has come, that this remarkable accumulation of power and capacity now has to exert itself fully to a leading role on the global stage. And so I, it's, it's hard to compare and contrast, um, but I will also say that y you can sense in some of the interactions between President Xi and uh, and President Putin in Russia, even though Putin is, you know, running a country that theoretically is not ideological, he is a man of the Soviet era. And they both together bemoan the treachery of Mikhail Gorbachev. And it's very clear that this early period of partnership between the Soviet Union and China, something that Xi Jinping's father was deeply involved in, clearly animates both of their psychologies. That's a long and not very good answer to a very good question. But I do think more time has to be given um, to sort of thinking about this role of ideology. I, I, I do think in various eras of Soviet power beginning at the turn of the last century, they were more ambitious about internationalizing their model. Mm -hmm. Obviously, 
the Communist International. I, 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 I don't think there are signs of a similar kind of ideological international approach yeah. uh, of China. I think in many respects, they feel that they are unique and that can't be replicated. The steps that they've taken internationally have been to provide capacities, either technology or police services or whatever on the at the behest of local authoritarians, whether it's in Africa or um, the Pacific or South Asia, to try to prop up con uh, leaders that are that tend to be more flexible sure. on issues that matter to China. So if you could um, assign Xi a book to perhaps, you know, color his worldview in a way which, you know, would more reflect your version of reality. Can I also or, just say one yeah. thing I should have said at the beginning, Rush Doshi's book is sensational. My Soviet power towards, or Soviet policy towards South Africa is not. And it that was good. It's like no, a six and a half, seven. That, no, yeah. not really. But First it, book. It, I actually won an award several years ago in Britain. Remember, I got a call about it. And they said, you know, congratulations, Soviet policy towards South Africa is what award. I think, oh, terrific. What was it? It was like the book made most irrelevant by history. No. So, no, seriously, no. seriously. So It's coming but, back, man. No, this it's is... not. No, it's not. <laughs> But so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I didn't okay. interrupt you, but Russia's book is sensational. All right. So I don't think she needs to read Russia's book. Yeah. So look, let, let me just begin to broaden that question just a little bit. I think some of the things that we hear from people uh, in China today suggests that the kind of information uh, and the people that that President Xi gets information from is increasingly limited. Yeah. And that sometimes it's hard in the system currently to speak truth to power. And so we are seeing uh, a repeat of history of the kind that we saw in the Maoist period where, you know, only a certain kind of leader, a certain kind of information makes it to the very top. And so that does concern us that, you know, you, uh, you, know, you like very much for the people that you're engaging with to have a deep, full understanding of the world in which they're operating. I think what we see in a variety of places like Ukraine, we think China's calculus and decision-making has been informed by a number of things that are concerning. We can talk more about that as the interview goes on. And so when you ask me to read, like, what would... Um, what one book or one article, what I would really or like. Or a course, or, you know, yeah, we could, you can. I'd, I'd just like him to have a general library card where he could go in and get access to a variety of things and sort of double check the the information, rosy often, uh, that he's receiving from his um, underlings and his staff. Um, you mentioned earlier sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the China we're seeing today for all the objectionable things they're doing around the world is very different than Mao making global revolution. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think it's probably a better thing for the world if, you know, you have a slightly, you know, the the sort of like uh, manifestations of the whatever, however big the ultimate ambitions are, stay, um, you know, not nearly as kinetic as they were for some parts of the Cold War. Is there, you know, how do you think about that and what can the U.S. do to... Um, shake that around the edges so look you know uh deterrence is a huge part of what we're involved in a variety of places trying to make clear that provocative or adventurous activities uh that are antithetical to the maintenance of peace and stability will be resisted um it is true that there were periods that mao was um you know uh talked openly about nuclear weapons use, was um, quite prepared to take risks, calculated risks often, but um, very much uh, prepared to take those risks. Um, I, I think um, President Xi in certain circumstances has shown a propensity to take certain risks, but also has been careful in other circumstances. And if anything, I find elements of his approach 
uh, not easily uh, to predict. I wouldn't have anticipated, for instance, such a deep Chinese commitment to President Putin. It doesn't seem to be me to be fundamentally in um, Chinese interest, but the more you understand the mindset of both leaders, I think you start to appreciate um, what animates that partnership. But a variety of things. When, when I, in previous periods when I worked on China, I found that their diplomats were some of the most expert and capable on the world and they, in the world, and they generally followed certain, um, you know, tenets that um, you could come to expect. So, for instance, when it became clear in the 1990s that some of the most important challenges uh, for China would be from the sea, from their uh, eastern seaboard. They quickly settled almost all their territorial disputes with many countries that they bordered. And what you generally saw was a China that would seek to take on one or two challenges and then try to either hold or settle so that they wouldn't find themselves operating simultaneously on several fronts at once. What's surprising and a little concerning is how China has been prepared to move out in a variety of circumstances against a number of countries in ways that I think um, create more unity of purpose uh, for uh, some of these countries. I... I um, uh, th there are a number of countries that would prefer a different kind of relationship but have found it difficult. I think India, for instance, wants a deeper technology partnership, but because of the steps that China has taken along the line of actual control in 2020 and before, it's made India you know, much more resistant and reluctant to take those steps. And so I... Um, it's, again, a, a very good, broad uh, question, and I'm struck personally by um, how much uh, China in recent years has either intentionally or unintentionally alienated countries that otherwise would have preferred to partner with them. Um, do you think Xi and whatever comes next after, you know, the party he created you know, figures out what happens after him. Um, uh, it will content itself with living under an American, you know, operating system, save just like a change in the national, in the sort of global balance of power, power which is so obvious that, you know, no, there's, there's really nothing doing there. Well, so, I mean, I, I actually would probably take question, I'd take issue with your question. I do not believe that what is being suggested or articulated is the idea of w w living, quote, quote, under a, an American operating system. Sure. I would argue that if you looked at the last 60 or 70 years, that operating system, which is complex, you've done your homework, so you know the pieces of it, you know, peaceful resolution of disputes, you know, uh, open lines of communication, freedom of navigation, all the different elements that go into that. I think I would argue that the last 70 or 80 years have been fantastic for Asia. In fact, I think you'd find people that would say, look, this operating system has been great for China, maybe not as great for us. We lost a lot of jobs, lost a lot of innovation during that period. I, I would probably try to search back against that. But, but that's not how they see it. Right. Well, but, or, but, but I think there is an undeniable quality of Chinese um, uh, growth and prosperity during this period. I think you could argue now this is largely due to the hard work of the Chinese people, but this larger context, which we helped build, delivered for China some of the very best periods, decades in uh, China's history. And so, no, they, they would take full credit for that. And they, but, but the truth is that the United States helped provide that context. And so it's not as if this period has meant shackles for China. They have grown, they have developed, they have uh, matured technologically in so many different ways. And so I, I, I don't think we're suggesting that 
the United States wants to somehow um, uh, curtail all elements of Chinese growth. But what we're concerned by are some manifestations that seek to alter this system in ways that are antithetical to the interests, not just the United States, but all of these countries. How do you hope the Biden administration's Asia policy is remembered and how are you worried it might be? I mean, look, I hope people will see it, that it's consequential. I hope people will see that it's bipartisan. I hope that people will understand that in regional terms, for the first time in our history, the Indo-Pacific is at the center geographically. There are other issues that are going to be important, but the, 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 the dynamism of the global economy of all issues associated with what's important on the global stage are playing out in large part in the Indo-Pacific. I think that's of, of critical import. And then you're going to want, hopefully, to see that the seeds of a continuing dominant, important American role um, uh, continues. And so I, I, I would say those are the things that you hope for. And you worry that either the American body politic um, um, grows uh, tired of those exertions or in an environment in which China has been ambivalent to create mechanisms for the kinds of communications and crisis prevention that are necessary, I think, to operate in this current arena that somehow yeah. there is an accident or miscalculation that ex escalates unintentionally. So there are lots of things to worry about, but those are a couple. Um, you, you talked about engagement. You, you recently said there's, there's a danger in being a wildly ardent suitor when it comes to engagement. Um, can you sort of talk through that as well as the, I don't know, bull case of what um, en engagement could realistically achieve over know, the next 18 months? Well, look, you know, we, we believe that finding some careful arenas uh, where the United States and China can work together, whether it's on fentanyl or certain elements of climate change. I mean, we could go through a list together. I think those things are uh, areas that we'd like to see continue. Um, we'd like very much some educational initiatives to continue. Uh, and, um, you know, just the general policy and practice of no surprises, I think, can be an effective ingredient in um, uh, this era of uh, diplomacy and statesmanship. I, I, so I, I think continuing uh, high-level engagement, um, practical areas of uh, communication in an environment in which competition remains the dominant theme in our relationship is what we can hope for and work towards. And I think that's what we will be inclined to do. And then your first part of the question was again. Um, if you're too uh, wildly ardent a suitor, yeah. what, so, what can that lead you to? So, I, you know, the, there's a constant table setting in diplomacy with China. Um, and I think there is, uh, you know, certain things that if you're involved in it, you see on a regular basis. One is that the idea that the ball is always in our cart. We're always going to be the one that are going to have to take some steps. And the other is that we want diplomacy more than they do. And that somehow that makes us needy. Now, now the truth is that because we are and have been a great power in many respects, China is ascending to this. We actually take, frankly, more seriously some of the responsibilities of being a global power and the communication that we think is um, required uh, in that evolution. I think we take that probably more serious than China. So we are quite keen on establishing certain military communications and other uh, lines of, uh, of interaction. Um, but at the same time, I think allies and partners are unnerved if they feel that the United States is um, is uh, too uh, enthusiastic about the need to settle down and 
some sort of discussions and that we will give away some things that will be important in deliberations. Much of that is a um, residue from an earlier period. I think we're likely heading into a different period in which there's less focus on, you know, like who wants diplomacy more. Most of these countries want a predictable, steady degree of communication between the United States and China, sort of not too cold, not too hot. And I think that probably is where the United States lands as well. I think the interesting question, and the one that we cannot answer, is um, currently in recent period, China does seem interested and prepared to engage in diplomacy with the United States, but how long will that last? Is face in diplomacy like a real thing particular to East Asia? Um, I, I feel like Western politicians can also get embarrassed. Um, and is there some dynamic where like American orientalizing of the concept is then like weaponized by Asian countries to get us to do things we wouldn't otherwise do? Well, let me answer the first part of the question. Like anyone who's worked in Asia understands that a huge element of diplomacy is the idea of face. And in many respects, face can be more important than the actual reality of agreements reached or issues discussed. And we see that in encounters, not just with China, but with many countries um, in the Indo-Pacific. However, I think your first point is a wise one. Um, uh, Americans, other leaders have face too. They can be um, embarrassed. They can find themselves, you know, on the other ends of things that are difficult to explain. I, I find it interesting that oftentimes the interlocutors in China that are most focused on their face have less or lesser focus on ours. But the truth is that, that it goes both ways. And so I think an effective diplomacy would have several characteristics. One, I think trying to avoid surprises is important. And probably secondly, recognizing that the, there is a dignity to engagement and you have to show your counterpart appropriate respect. Is it? And we're not always great at that, by yeah. the way. So this is, this is in many respects aspiration. Yeah. Um, speaking of interlocutors, you know, parties come and go. Folks get, you know, you've had plenty of transitions in uh, South Korea, the Philippines. You have new people to talk to. Is it weird when folks like disappear on you? Well, or, or what does it mean? I don't know. So, I mean, there's disappearing and there's disappearing, yeah. right? So. It is sometimes sad when you work closely with a counterpart and they either retire or go on to a new assignment. But oftentimes you see those people again and people who really work on the end of the Pacific in these various places, when they retire, they often retire into uh, you know positions in which they continue to be actively involved. Yeah, that's not what I was getting. At. I know, I did. I'm trying to, I'm trying to answer delicately your okay. question. But like, you know, I, um, there are probably a few senior people in the Chinese system I don't know if we'll ever see again. And that is unusual, yes. Um, do you think there's any aspect of original sin in modern U.S. policy towards China and how um, the Bush administration responded to Tiananmen? Well, well. I thought when you were talking about original sin, you were going to go back much earlier. I mean, for, first of all, I think the Chinese would, um, if we were in a diplomatic exchange on this, would take great um, uh, pains to go through all of our historic original sins. And they would not be just ten of men. They w you would look at... Oh, I'm thinking the inverse. That you're, like, the leniency that was shown then... Um, you know, if it if there was a sort of more sustained uh, uh, kind of negative reaction to that, then then sort of history might have turned out differently. It's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Maybe in retrospect, at the time, it felt a lot to China like isolation, and that it took 
a significant period to get things back on track. And I think the shadow of Tiananmen um, uh, casts a long, uh, dark uh, image in Chinese politics currently. And so even though, you know, there weren't immediate sanctions, there are things that are um, significant that continue. I think the Tiananmen is a continuing feature of contemporary politics with respect to China. And so I don't, I'm more worried about something like Hong Kong, which seems to have happened with, uh, you know, steps that China's taken in Hong Kong that, that they feel that, you know, they escaped without very much, um, you know, public sure. criticism. And so, um, I, I think it's something that we always have to be attentive to more generally, but I, I, I just think Tiananmen is too strong and too important ever to be uh, thought of as a, as being just something that existed on the side. So uh, I feel like it's almost a, a dirty secret in the American China watching community that this fear that America isn't ready for a national conversation about what um, a commitment to Taiwan would really mean in worst case scenarios. Do you think like having that is necessary to create the deterrence needed to ward off terrible things happening? So look, um, that you were kind enough to say I've served in a lot of capacities um, over a long period of time. One of the things you learn usually the hard way is not to be too loquacious and to answer a lot of hypotheticals associated with Taiwan. Uh, I would simply say I think U.S. policy is clear. I think it is bipartisan. And I think we are determined to maintain the status quo and peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I think increasingly that is accepted as a bipartisan national objective. And I think we will do everything possible we can to sustain it. So almost a year ago today, um, your boss, Jake Sullivan, announced that the U.S. was now aiming to maintain as large of a lead as possible in critical emerging technologies like AI and semiconductors. Is that still um, policy today? I think our policy continues to be one that we need and uh, will continue to invest in critical technologies and where possible make sure that we have a competitive edge um, and to do some of that um, with allies and partners. And so, yes, I do think we recognize and believe that, again, to your first question, one of the core elements of national, comprehensive national power is the ability to set standards create market share and uh, uh, innovate at the highest levels with respect to critical technologies. And the two that you mentioned are two, only two of, of, of many in which the United States, I think I would argue, needs to continue to invest, uh, be disciplined about and focused on. So which risk profile to you is scarier? The one in which U.S. Um, you know, is too tight or too loose with its export um, uh, control restrictions around these critical technologies? Well, look, it's, you know, those that's a very sort of up or down question. It's a complicated, but if you're forcing me to answer, I would probably be more worried about too loose. But I, like, I, I would just point out that, that much of our international system over decades has been designed that at its core are efficiencies and lowest, you know, uh, costs for production, uh, you know, uh, accepting, uh, you know, certain capabilities and technologies are better done in some places than others, right? But I think we're probably heading into a new period where a new set of calculus is important, you know, um, resilience, durability, uh, you know, the, uh, the opportunity to be able to uh, count on more than one source of supply. All those steps build redundancy into the system. 
And I think probably those steps are smart and they will continue. So, it, but it is a substantial reorientation of the system that had been about just in time, that had been about maximizing efficiency over resiliency. And I think we're reorienting towards um, a system that's more predictable. It may be higher cost in certain areas. Uh, maybe slightly slower, but we think we'll probably be made more durable uh, uh, in uh, event of a crisis. Um, so Huawei recently announced it could fab a seven nanometer chip. Um, you know, the way I read October 7th, that line was set a little higher than that as a sort of goal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how would you define success? Is it that sort of differential as far as possible with two lines, you know, going in opposite directions? And at what point, you know, is it, would it be wise to sort of, um, I don't know, where, where, you know, where, where does the, where do the differential start to be worrisome to start to, um, uh, you know, do more than just the promote stuff? I mean, look, you know, it, that differs according to various technologies more generally, 5G, AI, um, semiconductors, each of those have slightly different comparative um, assessments associated with them. I, I, I would say that, um, that the key here is that uh, there are some technologies that we've innovated that we would prefer to um, uh, uh, inhibit from animating certain military and security capabilities in China. And we've, we've stated clearly, and, we, and I think we've taken steps to prevent the proliferation of some of those capabilities and technologies. Um, that will be challenging under the best of circumstances. Ultimately, what our technology frame has to be about is running faster, making the appropriate investments, the smart investments to work more closely with allies and partners, and to realize that that is going to be an essential feature of global leadership. And I think that's what, with the various initiatives um, involved with domestic investments in technology, that's exactly what the Biden administration has sought to do. Um, I, 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 you know, the, there are active debates about how effective or successful certain kinds of limitations or steps designed to limit the outflow of technology to China can be. That's why ultimately the most important steps that we can take are about running faster, about investing in capabilities in the United States. And I think that those are steps that are generally widely appreciated. I got like 10, I got like 15 questions in 10 minutes. So we'll do, right. we'll do some rapid fire. Um, how do you get things done? And how or should America like speed up its, you know, executive branch decision making OODA loop? Well, look, you know, I enjoyed this time around in public service a lot. I've got an incredible team here in the White House. They're inventive. They are um, relentless. They are extraordinarily good car colleagues. And we've worked um, well with the interagency more generally. I mean, I. I would like to see, you know, more resources. Anyone in government who works in these on these issues would say more resources. Um, I think uh, the challenge has been that the amount of of uh, diplomacy that is required in the Indo-Pacific is remarkable, and it would tax anyone. Um, and I've been very impressed at how the president has. Um, exerted himself on behalf of uh, American purpose in the Indo-Pacific, but sustaining that over long periods of time, great distances, very challenging. Overall, I think um, a relatively good job here, but more work to do. Um, pick two bureaucracies from history, maybe one American and one global. Like, where would you want to be a fly on the wall for? I mean, I, I'm... I'm quite fascinated by the solarium, you know, process that that President Eisenhower ran at earlier parts of the Cold War when he tried to get various institutions in the U.S. government together to try to think about how to 
operationalize and synchronize efforts to prepare effectively for a systemic competition with the former Soviet Union. I'd like to hear some of those deliberations, and I would, I would be fascinated to hear a meeting of the Standing Committee at any period in history, now or forty years ago. Uh, what do you think you've learned about the world, about how the world works, from your wife? From my wife? Yeah. Just about. I, I mean, I don't think I. I'm not the person to go to and talk to if you want to learn about economics, but my wife is incredibly good at explaining complex complex concepts. I remember she was explaining to me what the J curve was. I had no idea. Um, she's a deeply thoughtful and knowledgeable person on all things. I think probably though the what she's taught me the most about is how to raise girls and how to think about how uh, a young woman or girl uh, thinks about the world. I, I think I know a little bit myself, but she's really helped me on that substantially. So yeah, let's let's do your kids then. What do you think you've learned from them that you know matters from a... Oh gosh, <laughs> so much from each. I mean, they're just like, you don't realize these little human beings, you know, each grow up to be different people. My oldest is a, is a screenwriter out of California and probably the funniest person in our family and i've probably learned more from her about figuring out how to laugh at myself because her sort of imitations and you know hilarious you know hijinks involving making fun of me are fantastic fair in our family can you tell me about um gold mining in armenia i don't know i don't know very much about gold mining but i can tell you so i i grew up in California. I, I grew up in a place called Fresno, outside of Fresno. I thought growing up that one of the dominant groups in our country were Armenians because my high school, my high school. Oh, that's like, where it comes from. Okay. Yeah. So they, and many of them went on when Armenia became independent, they went on to become major players in Armenia. Um, uh, and, you know, they played a huge role in sort of the Armenian diaspora uh, movement. I grew up there. I played violin there. I had a chance to get a, an educational scholarship. So I went to the former Soviet Union, Soviet Armenia, and then also had some time in Moscow as well. But I have, I have very fond memories of growing up there and learning about that culture. But I remember, if you can imagine, that was basically my first time going abroad. And so when the Armenians left um, Armenia uh, around the First World War and with the genocide with Turkey and they came to settle in the United States. They settled in the San Joaquin Valley in California because it looked so much like where they came from in Armenia, Yerevan, the capital city. So I remember on my, really as like a 19 year old, my first real trip abroad and I traveled all these different flights and I landed in Armenia and Yerevan, I'm looking around and I go, this looks exactly like where I'm from. <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. Um, three minutes, let's do three questions. Okay. So, um, you know, it seems like often in public, you're just shouting out random books and think tank papers. Um, and you good. feel- what a, what a nice compliment. Yeah, you know, it's, it seems like you're not working the umps, but it's like actually sincere. Um, you know, how does the sort of outside analysis, journalism, interact in your head with the classified stuff and you know what advice do you have for all of us out here like to be useful I, so i i didn't realize i was spouting stuff but i actually find that like reading history is both unbelievably helpful at, at sort of confronting modern challenges but it's also so important to like, sometimes when you read biographies and stuff and you realize the psychologies of these people when they're dealing with these things, that they're also realizing how hard it is, how challenging it is. And nothing was preordained, a lot of hard work, luck, a chance went into some of these decisions. And so I, I, I love reading, I love promoting um, good books. I believe research and writing is hugely important. I try to focus on basically every serious article written on the Indo-Pacific or the world. I try to really keep abreast because I think it's important. And I do think there is a role for deep analysis and either quantitative or comparative um, in decision-making. And I think that's probably my experience in academia, but I'm not 
I'm not going to stop. Even though you, you've curled that insult in me, I'm going to continue to mention books. <laughs> uh, it's a compliment. Um, so uh, two more. So you can pause time and spend three years writing a book. Is it you're, you're going back to the solarium? What's your, what's your topic? I mean, I'd, I'd really like to write one last book. But, you know, like what I'm interested in writing and what people are interested in reading could be two very different things. But you know what happens in a career, you know, you turn around and you're old. And I've worked now in the Indo-Pacific for like almost 40 years. And I've seen a lot of stuff. I've met some of the key players. And, you know, I think there probably is some wisdom there and some interesting stories and some anecdotes. I think it would be interesting potentially to write that, but I like, you know, like the pivot sold like seven copies. And so, you know, you just don't know how interested people will be in what you do. Gotcha. So it's the, it's the memoir angle we're thinking now. Um, you know, you mentioned you've been doing Asia for 40 years. It's like sort of an accident of history. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the the brightest minds of your generation were focused on Russia and the, and the Soviet Union. And, yeah. You know, we basically had 40 years of the most senior leadership in America having that as a background, regardless of what's yeah. happening. And, you know, the shift is still happening today. Tony Blinken's first book was about, yes. um, you know, Soviet pipelines. Um, what is that? impacts, you know, how does that shape policy and what is it going to mean when 20 years from now, you know, Rush and Julian and Mira, um, you know, who who really yeah. invested the time and the language and the, whatever are the now so, been the ones running things. So it's a, it's a great question, but it's a more complicated answer. So I don't think it's just the area that you focused on. It's the era in which you lived. And one of the things that I am struck by, the generation that came just right before me was so scarred, influenced, um, determined by Vietnam. And I saw that when President Biden visited Vietnam two weeks ago. And it affected the trajectory of national politics of the Democratic Party and the like. One of the things that I'm I'm um, quite impressed by with this new generation of policymakers is that when they think about China, and they're engaged on China. They're, um, it's not that they're less romantic or mystical about China, but they're extraordinarily well-trained um, and they're quite practical. And I think they have also experienced what the last, the, their dominant period of experience is the last 10 or 15 years. It's not necessarily the drama and wonder of the opening and the recognition in 19 late 1970s and early 1980s. Um, I do feel that a huge part of my job has been to identify, help engage, encourage, and support people in this line of work. And I don't think I'm a great boss or a mentor, but I think about it a lot. And when it, you mentioned some of those people, but there's a much longer list. When I think of those people that will animate and stock our bureaucracies in the period ahead, I'm encouraged. So the violin, there's no frets. It's really hard to learn to play in tune. You can't make chords. The bow is just this weird thing. I mean, make the case for it. This is like a very frustrating instrument. Yeah. I, I really can't now because I play the viola more and viola is more harmony than melody. Um, it has deeper tones and chords. It's less showy. It's less embarrassing if you make a mistake. Also the dirty little secret about like if you're interested in quartets or chamber music, there are tons of violinists but not as many violists. And so like recent years, I don't, I'm not really playing or practicing very much, but you know, a few years ago when I was- You get the um, invite still. No, but like, you know, there, there's always room for uh, a violist, um, but not as many for violinists. And the viola is a lovely, beautiful um, instrument, underrated, frankly. And although much modern, um, uh, contemporary music and even older music has been repurposed more for the viola as it enjoys a surge in uh, popularity. So did you grow up on Suzuki? 
I did not. You no, didn't. No, I think I think I grew up even before Suzuki. Before Suzuki. I mean, like like it, prehistoric. We had we had wheels, but that's about it. Yeah. All right. Well, sorry. Um, okay. So the the thank you for you is a, a biography of Suzuki, which sort of doubles as. Uh, a history of Japan in the 20th century. That's it's written true. by Aaron Arihota, who did Japan 1941. I, I know that. Yeah. And um, he lived this crazy life. Like he invented it as a response to rising Japanese nationalism in the 1930s. Cause he was like, this is dehumanizing. It's like, I need to let the kids like be free and flourish. So anyways. This is great. Thank you for the uh, book and uh, congratulations on 300 episodes. I hope you have 300 more. You know, I want to, I think I played it cool for the past hour, but I'm like very overwhelmed. You um, uh, took this interview and um, uh, was, were as serious as you, you took it as seriously as you did. So best of luck. I'll look forward to listening to it. All the best to you. Thank you so much for being a part great. of China. Thank you. Okay. That's great. Thank you.